Um, I have to tell you in all candor, I'm a little nervous about being here today. I've never done a presentation for grandparents only. So, but I've always felt like this is a group that I certainly identify with. So, and I, and I happen to believe that grandparenting may be one of those few things in life that isn't overrated. I mean, I thought it was gonna be good, but it is, it's even better than I thought. They call me Poppy. Um, you know, I get to play and do all those things that, uh, that, that they love to do, and, and so it keeps you young. So, um, but I've never done a presentation for grandparents before. The second piece is, I've never done this presentation before, and it's been two years because COVID hit, and I, I haven't done a presentation in two years. I'm not even sure I'm gonna remember what I'm supposed to talk about here, okay? Um, but they have me, uh, I have some heart issues, so they have me on a couple of drugs um, that kind of change you from a type A to a type B personality. So I may not remember what I'm supposed to say, but I don't give a rip, which is really an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting way to live your life, right? Um, so, um, so I'm a little nervous and doing this in front of your friends and neighbors is, is really risky because if it doesn't go well, I'm gonna see people at the pickleball court or at TNC and I, and I can't hide, right? Usually you do it in the community and if it doesn't go well, you leave and they never see you again. So this is risky business. But then I, I realized kind of starting out today, it's really not that risky. Um, it's not that risky because uh, there's a wonderful book called The Wisdom of Crowds. John Selawicki is the author. And what he says in a crowd this large and this diverse, because we got another 30 people, 30 people online, um, the crowd is smarter than the guy up front. <laughs> there's more wisdom in this room than I possess. Um, and, and my job today is kind of tap the collective wisdom of the group. So this is gonna go just fine if you participate. So that's the, that's the idea. And although April did a wonderful job of introducing me, I knew she would because I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, wanna, I wanna introduce myself a little differently because I don't wanna talk to you today as a prevention professional. I wanna talk to you today as a poppy, as a grandpa. Okay, I want to introduce you by introducing my grandchildren. Okay, my wife Sherry and I have four, um, and we have two daughters and, and four grandchildren. And um, on the on the left here, the the taller of the two is Alex. Um, this is a an older picture, but Alex just turned seventeen last month. He uh, he's really into Legos, and many of us have grandkids who are really into Legos, and he designs Legos, he puts them online, and if you don't know this, if you have grandkids that love Legos, you can go to Lego Ideas and they can post their idea online, and people around the world can vote on them, and with liking them. If you get 10,000 likes, 10,000, um, Lego gets you money, and then they review your, your creation, and if they choose to build it, um, they give you royalties off this. During the pandemic, Alex, created three online Lego ideas. Two have gone to 10,000, which is unheard of. He's actually in two Lego contests. He won one and came in second in the other. And his build is going to be in Denmark in the Lego Museum. And today, this is a big day. I got to show you this. This is, this is grandpa stuff. His latest design is a Tuscan Villa. And I want you to look at the votes right now. 9,991 during this meeting, his bill will go to 10,000 and be part of that review. Now, he wants to be an engineer, he wants to be an architect, and I'm proud of him for all this stuff, but he's a really good guy. I've been kind of struggling with some health stuff recently. I got a care package from him yesterday. He made me brownies, right? They live in Portland. But he's really good to his little brother. He's a good guy. Um, Dylan, that's the little guy on the left. Um, <clears throat> Dylan has a mind like a steel trap, like his great grandpa. He knew every bridge in Portland at age four, and he knew whether they were a suspension bridge or whether they were another kind of bridge, right? He knew all the states and the capitals at age five. He knew all of the presidents at age six, and, and, and he knew things about them. Get back here. 
Gotcha. And he knew things about them. As an example, he said to my wife, he said, Grandma, if you were two inches taller, you'd be taller than James Madison. <laughs> he now knows all, he, he's really into basketball. He knows all the teams in the last three, March Madness. He knows where they placed. He knows who they played. He knows what seed they were. And he now is into Beatles music, and he knows all the Beatles songs in order on all the albums, and he knows the length of time of each of those songs. Seriously, and if you don't believe me, I'll show you at break, okay? In fact, we were riding in the car not too long ago, and, and, and my daughter's driving, his mom, and he says, Poppy, do you like Beatles music? And I said, yeah. He said, do you know that song, Why Don't We Do It In The Road? <laughs> and I said, yeah. He said, why don't we talk about what we think they were going to do? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that soon he's going to realize what he asked. <laughs> But he is amazing. He has an amazing memory. Now, uh, Remy is the little girl on the left being held by Grandma. By the, by the way, that's my sweetie in, in both of these pictures. Um, Remy is 10. She loves animals. She's really creative. She is one of the best pretend players. Get close to the mic. The people on Zoom can hear as well. OK. She's one of the best pretend players that I, I know of. In fact, we play some pretend games together. Um, and she loves animals, and she has a new puppy and is delighted, okay? And Avon, the little guy on the right, the littlest guy, he can build anything. In fact, if you give him duct tape, string, and some sticks, he'll, he'll build, <laughs> he built a trap to catch me in, in the yard <laughs> without my knowledge, and he caught me, right? So he, he's amazing. Now, why did I start out like this this afternoon? Let me tell you why I started out like this. I could have told you that Alex is pretty obsessive and compulsive. I could have tell you, told you that Dylan has some executive functioning issues and he's a challenge to his teachers. I could have told you that Remy has a temper like her poppies and it's not her best quality. I could have told you when, when, when Avon was younger, he had a Hispanic nanny. He loved Spanish more than he loved English. And he would, he would talk about zapatos and, and pantalones and, and all of that. And, and at that point, he had, his, he had his manos and his pantalones more than I was comfortable with. <laughs> all right? I, I could have I told you what was wrong with my grandchildren. Instead, I chose to tell you what was right with them. Here's the first, I think, and one of the most important messages of the, of the day. You will do more to shape and change your grandchildren's behavior by focusing on what's right with them, not what's wrong with them. Okay? And sometimes we love them so much we focus on all the things they're not doing correctly. Don't go there right away. Spend more time focusing on what's right with them. Because when you focus on what's right, it gives you the energy to focus what's on what's not. Does that make sense to you? It gives you the passion and the energy to help them overcome some of those obstacles. But unless you can see the gifts they have, you don't have the passion to do the next step, all right? So with that, you've listened to me long enough. I, again, I wanna tap the wisdom in the room and I'm gonna ask you to try some things today. And you, those of you online, I know you don't have, a, you may be watching with a partner and I hope you are. But the first thing I want you to do is to think about what's right with your grandchildren, okay? Those of you who have them, if you don't have a grandchild, and I know at least one person in this room is here as a git. You know what a git is? A git is a grandparent in training. It's not there yet, <laughs> but you know they're gonna come and you wanna be ready when they show up, right? So if you don't have a grandchild, think about your own children for a moment. And I wanna take, in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to get up out of your chair. And I'm gonna ask you to wave your hand in the room if you don't have a partner. And I'm gonna ask you to, to pair up with somebody who's waving. And I want you to introduce yourself to the person you don't know in this room by telling them about your grandchild or children. Does that make sense? You can use pictures on your phone. And those of you at home, I want you to start making a list of what's right with your grandchildren while they're doing this little exercise. Here's the rules. You can only talk about what's right. You can't talk about what's wrong, okay? The second is, it's okay to brag. I just did, all right? And the third is, little things do count. 
Think about those little things that you really love about them and appreciate about them. Make sense? All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I need you to stand up. I need you to find a partner. Those of you at home, I need you to start making a list of what's right with your grandchildren. Wave your hand in the air if you don't have a partner. Thank you for doing this, and that's kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah, sure. You get to brag a little bit and, and talk about them. But here's, um, this afternoon, I'm going to give you a few assignments. And the first assignment, these are all obviously voluntary. I'm not going to check up on you. But uh, the first assignment is tonight, before you go to bed, um, if, if the grandchild that you talked about um, is old enough, I want you to either FaceTime with them or call them or write them a little note. <clears throat> and I want you to say, I was at a meeting today and I talked about you. And here's what I said. They need to know what you say about them publicly. And when they do, again, some of our children love words of affirmation, our grandchildren. And if you don't have one that's old enough to really appreciate that, some of us have little guys, really little ones. Um, so if you don't have one that's old enough to appreciate that, I want you to, to share with the parent of that little one what you appreciate about them. What we're talking about here is not just what grandchildren need, it's what humans need. And our, and our kids need to know that we appreciate them and we see how great a job they're doing with our grandkids. Does that make sense? So if you can't send it to your grandkid, send it to your kids, all right? That's your first assignment. Now, <clears throat> let me tell you a little bit um, I know a little bit more about my background. I, um, <clears throat> I've worked on a variety of, of behavioral health issues over the years with a wonderful team of folks. And uh, <clears throat> I got hired in 1972 because we had a terrible drug problem in King County. I was the drug, drug education coordinator for King County. Evidently, I did my job really well because after one year, the funding went away. <laughs> and, I, and I viewed that as we cleared up the drug problem in one year. <laughs> And, and the next year, I got hired as the teen pregnancy coordinator for the county. Teen <laughs> I got hired as the teen pregnancy prevention coordinator <laughs> for the county, which, which is a little different if you think about that for a moment. And evidently, I did my job really well because after one year, the funding went away. <laughs> the year after that, it was sexually transmitted diseases. This is what we do in America, and it drives me crazy. We look at the disease of the month or the organ of the year, and, and we focus on it for maybe a year or two, and then we go on, but the issue is still there in front of us and our children, right? <clears throat> and here's also what we do in America that drives me crazy. We look at the kids who don't make it. We look at the kids who use drugs. We look at the kids who are violent. We look at the kids who drop out early, and we ask what went wrong here, and how do we fix them? <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a frog here. <clears throat> no, I'm, I'm okay, but thank you. Um, instead, here's what I think we need to do. Who do we need to look at? We need to look at those children who are doing well. We need to look at the children who come from adversity and make it in spite of that adversity. They are the most interesting children to look at. It's my contention if we understood what makes a difference for our kids who come from adversity, we'd be in a better position to help all of our kids grow up healthy. Does that make sense? We need to look at those incredibly resilient children. And I want to give a, a thumbs up to Raising Resilience and BYS because that's what you guys have been doing for years now in this community. They've taken, I think, the right view of where we need to go. So I just want to acknowledge this isn't news to some of our professional colleagues and um, institutions in this community. So thanks for the good work. <clears throat> now, here's what I'm thinking. Um, I came across some work a few years ago by Search Institute. Search Institute is a research institute out of Minneapolis, Minnesota that has been looking at healthy, successful, thriving children for the last 25 plus years. They've been trying to figure out what kids need in order to succeed. They call these things developmental assets. I don't like the term. It kind of sounds like psychobabble. I want you to think of these as the fundamental building blocks that children need in order to succeed. 
You should have, if you're online, um, you, you were given a link to some handout materials. There is a handout, it looks kind of like this, <clears throat> and it's called Developmental Assets. I want to just give you a sample of what these assets look like. Look at number three on your list. Children who have three or more adults in their life, in addition to their parents, who spend time with them, who encourage them, who call them on things when they're doing things that are inappropriate, those children do better. How many of you believe that? Yeah. Look at number 11 on your list. No, look at number nine on your list. Kids who spend an hour a week in community service, giving back to the communities in which they live, they're not just takers, they're givers. Those children do dramatically better. How many of you believe that? They are less likely to, 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 in, to be involved in drug use. They're more likely to be academically successful. How many of you believe that? That's what the research says. Look at 11, 12, and 13 on your list. Kids who have boundaries, family boundaries, school boundaries, community boundaries do better. Help me out for a second, those of you in the audience and at home, I want you to think about this as well. How many of you growing up knew where the line was? How many knew when you crossed it? How many knew what would happen when you crossed it? Yeah, yeah not as clear for kids today. Or look at number 25 on your list. There's, by the way, the assets are divided into two categories, external assets and internal assets. External assets are the kinds of things that adults do with and for children. The internal assets are the qualities that we're trying to nurture in our kids, all right? They are things like a commitment to learning. How many of you read for pleasure? How many of you read for pleasure as a kid growing up? I have to say, um, during the pandemic, uh, my wife, Sherry, um, would read bedtime stories to our two youngest at least twice a week. They get all ready for bed, and they call grandma, FaceTime, and she was reading a series called The Boxcar Children. I don't know if you know that series, but they loved it. And twice a week at least, Sherry would read them, and they would have a bedtime story from grandma. And they live in the Bay Area, and we live here on Bainbridge Island. So this is... We have to get creative about how we do this, but reading for pleasure is really important because kids who read for pleasure do better. They do, they're less in involved in high-risk behavior, they're more involved in supporting their friends and peers, and they do better in terms of thriving as they grow older, okay? Look at number 35 on your list. Kids who know how to say no to their friends do better. <laughs> We had a whole campaign many years ago, and some of you are old enough to remember this. It came out from the First Lady of the United States, and it was called Just Say No. Saying to a child, just say no, is like saying to someone who's clinically depressed, just have a nice day. What's the question in the kid's mind? How? If you're not answering the how, you're not empowering children. Your grandchildren need to know how, not just what to do, but how to do it. So here's, here's my goal for this afternoon. Um, I appreciate everybody's here, but being here doesn't change anything. I want to expose you to this model for a moment, and then I want to give you at least four different strategies that you can go home and do with your grandkids tomorrow or tonight um, or next week that help to build these assets with your grandchildren. Does that make sense? I think it's about trying to move from good to great. And what I do know on Bainbridge Island, <laughs> there's a lot of really good grandparenting going on. In fact, I always say to my wife, I think you're still in the running for grandma of the year, but the competition is really stiff. But here's what I've learned over the years. Because lots of good things are going on here, good oftentimes is the enemy of great. Because when you think you're good, Sometimes that's enough. Does that make sense? The difference between good and great is measured in millimeters, not miles. It's the little things that we do consistently that really make a huge difference for our grandchildren. So today I want to talk about how do we move from good to great? And again, it's little changes in behavior, all right? 
those assets, rather than listening to me any longer talk about the assets, by the way, I don't think people act on models because I say they're important. I don't think you act on models because they're research-based. I think you act on models that resonate with you personally. Again, there's a lot of wisdom in this room. You know what made a difference for you as a kid growing up. And those things are still important for our grandchildren today. I want you to take yourself back in time to age 15 or 16. For some of us in this room, it's a long trip back. <laughs> and if you're having a hard time remembering 15 or 16, think about the music. I know Tom Kelly can do that, and I know Dean can do that. They can name any song like this. Think about your friends, think about the music, think about where you were at age 15 or 16, and I want you to go down this list of developmental assets, and I want you to put a check mark beside two or three of them that were really important to you as a kid growing up at age 15 or 16. For those of you at home online, I want you to go down the list and put a check mark beside each of these that was there for you growing up. And I want you to circle the two or three that were most important to you. Got it? It'll take you just a minute to do that. So take a minute. Here in the audience, I just want you to pick two or three. In our virtual audience, I want you to go down the list and put a check mark beside all that were there for you. And then I want you to circle the two or three that were most important. Ready? Go. You got three minutes to do it. Now, even if you haven't finished, if you've got two or three identified on this list that were important to you, here's what I want you to do. Here in this room, what I want you to do is turn around, face somebody behind you that you don't know. You can have a group of two or three, and I want you to talk about what were the two or three on your list that were most important and why? You got just a couple minutes to do that, so make sure everybody gets a chance to talk. And I would just suggest turn your chair around and talk with the person behind you. For those of you at home who are doing this, here's what I need you to do. I want you to count up how many of these you had. So go down that list of 40, count up how many you had. And again, make sure you've circled the two or three that were most important. Then I'll tell you what we're going to do with that. Now, <clears throat> thanks for doing this. And thank you at home for going through that list. I'll, actually, I'm going to come back to you in, in a couple minutes about what those numbers mean, because I think you'll find this interesting. Um, how many of you in the audience found you had common ground on this list, even though you picked somebody you don't even know? that some of the things you talked about were important to both of you. Yeah. And those of you at home tonight, if, if you have a partner that's not there with you, have them go through the list and see if you have common ground, uh, things that were important to both of you growing up. Um, what were some of those things, real quickly? What were some of the things that people said were important? Strong neighborhoods. Strong neighborhoods. How many of you still feel like you live in a pretty strong neighborhood online and here? Yeah. And, and I think it's why many of us chose to live on Bainbridge Island, right? What else did you talk about? What else made a difference? Yes. 16 high expectations. High expectations. How many of us grew up with people around us expecting a lot from us? How many of you tried to meet those expectations? How many of you are still trying to meet those expectations? Seriously, how many of us still, even though a lot of those people are dead and gone and no longer in our lives, if they could see us doing our work, we would want them to be proud of the way we do our work. How many of you believe that? You know, and maybe they can. I think one and two for me were the best. Families. Yeah, yes. Yeah, and here's what I can tell you. Not all assets are created equal. The single best predictor on this list of whether children make it or not is families. And in a perfect world, all of our children would have and our grandchildren would have strong, loving, supportive families. I want to remind you, this is not a perfect world. And what I do know is the kids who make it, who come from adversity, oftentimes they find people who substitute for that strong family. They create new families. And, and grandparents are part of those families and neighbors and friends and coaches and teachers. 
It's about creating a safety net around our kids, right? So <clears throat> a couple things. Thanks for doing this. Let me just tell you a couple learnings that I've had from doing this work. The first is I love this list, but the list is not complete. Everything that a child needs is not on this list. I asked a group of high school students not too long ago, I said, what's missing from this list? You know what they told me? Pets. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> this young man laughed when he said it. I said, why do you think that's important? He said, well, my dog loves me no matter what I do. <laughs> so today's session is really about becoming the person that your dog thinks you are, right? Because <laughs> right. if you're as good as your dog thinks you are, you'd be better for your kids and grandkids, right? Um, another thing that I think is missing and one that I just want to point out because our girls, our two daughters grew up here on Bainbridge Island and I think it's something that is missing for a lot of kids on Bainbridge Island. So um, I think grit and perseverance are really important. And I, I want to point out, you don't develop grit. Grit is the ability to deal with crap in your life. You all know what crap is, right? <laughs> Crap, in my mind, is criticism, rejection, assholes, and pressure. That's crap. And a lot of our kids on Bainbridge, we try and shelter them from having to deal with any of that. But in fact, you don't become resilient if you haven't had to deal with any adversity. And I'm not suggesting that we create adversity for children, but we need to have them develop some grit. All right. There's a wonderful book, if I can grab that read. Um, it's called Grit. It's by Angela Duckworth. And um, she's a researcher, uh, I think, at Penn State and has done, I think, groundbreaking research on how you develop grit with your children and your grandchildren. All right. So the first thing I would tell you about the asset list is it's not complete. The second is it's not just for kids. How many of you still would like to have love and support in your life? Good, almost half of our audience here <laughs> feels that's important. That's really good. Um, how many of you still want people who believe in you and have high expectations for you? How many of you believe that giving back to your community and community service is important? Yeah. I just want to point out, this is not a list of what children need. It's a list of what human beings need. So the first thing is the list is not complete. The second is it's not just for children. And the third thing I've learned in working with this asset list is someone, I, I will use the term today, asset builder a lot. And, one, and recently somebody said, define an asset builder for me. Here's my definition. If you breathe, you're on the team. <laughs> Anybody can do this work. By the way, I was just in a conversation um, with the governor and some other people about what do we do about school violence. And one of the things I know is all of the conversations that are going on around the country, and, and I don't have any confidence that we're going to do anything significant about gun safety, but, but we're talking about mental health, and no one is talking about using our children as our partners in that work. And what I do know is our kids know when their friends are in trouble about two years before we pick it up as school staff members, we need to engage young people as our partners in this work. They can do this work as well. Who's the most powerful messenger if you're trying to reach a sixth grader? A sixth grader. Actually, it's a seventh or eighth grader. They model about two years up in their behavior, and they look up to those kids, and those kids are in a really powerful position to change the nature of our school environments and making them caring and supportive place for kids, okay? So anybody can do this. By the way, quick story. I was in the Saga School District in Southern California, and they, we did a break at about this point, and they, they, uh, they gave an award to one of their custodians. He's the school custodian in an elementary school. He's the night custodian. I'm not sure the kids would know him if they saw him on the street. He's in the building after hours. But here's what he did. He spray painted a dustpan gold. He calls it the Golden Dustpan Award. He leaves it in the classroom each evening that is the cleanest classroom. 
Children compete to get the Golden Dust Pan Award because he leaves it with cookies. The kids in this building call him the Cookie Monster. They write notes to the Cookie Monster, he writes notes back. When he got this award, he said to the staff, he said, I can't believe you're giving me an award for doing this. He said, I don't have to work as hard as I used to because the kids are cleaning the class. He said, and the cookies aren't very good, they're cheap. He said, but they write me notes each day and I write them notes back and they're writing more and I think that's good. Do you think he's an asset builder? Absolutely. There are thousands of ways of doing this work. Not one, but thousands, all right? So it's not complete, it's not just for kids. And if you breathe, you're on the team. Now, before we go any further, those of you at home in the virtual audience, I asked you to go through this list and count up how many you had. And you might wonder, so what? What's, what's the difference how many you had as a kid growing up? It's a huge difference. Here's what I can tell you. The average child in America today has 19 of these assets in their life. Three and a half million kids surveyed, reporting 19 and a half assets. And you might wonder, what does that mean? So those of you at home who counted up how many you had, compare your number to the number 19. And if you look at my screen here, what you can see is kids who had, let's look at right now, let's look at drug use. It's represented by the light blue, um, by the light blue column here, okay? I know we have a pop pointer. But children who had between zero and 10 assets, over 40% of them were engaged in illicit drug use. But those kids who had just 10 more, between 11 and 20, 15% were involved in illicit drug use. You see what happened? As assets increased, all of these high-risk behaviors decrease and the children who had over 30 of these assets, only 1% of them were engaged in illicit drug use. Why do I want you to build assets? Because when you do this, the higher the level of assets, the lower the level of high risk behavior for your grandchildren, all right? I want you to do it because it dramatically decreases high risk behavior on the part of children. But that's not the most important reason for doing this, okay? I want you to look at the second series of bar graphs. Those kids who had higher levels of assets did better in school, maintained their health better, valued diversity more in their communities. You see, by building assets, you get two for one. You get higher levels of thriving and you get lower levels of high risk behavior on the part of your grandchildren. That's why we need to do this. And the number 20 is really important. Let me just, I want to, I could do a deep dive into this data, but time doesn't allow. But let me just give you a few important pieces about the data. Girls score higher than boys on just about every asset. In fact, girls, the number 20 is really important. And when you look at the kids who have over 20, 54% of girls have over 20 assets, 42% of boys have over 40 assets. Big difference. Girls score higher than boys on just about every asset but two. If you have granddaughters, I want you to pay attention. The two that they score lower on is they don't feel safe. They don't feel as safe as boys. Safety is an issue for girls. And the second is their self-esteem. Tell me what's wrong with this picture. When girls score higher by more than 10 assets than the boys and feel less than the boys. Boys, on the other hand, score, score dramatically lower, but they feel just fine about themselves. <laughs> if I were to summarize this data, I would tell you that boys inflate their egos and girls don't believe in themselves. Huh? My daughter says her son has unqualified self-confidence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes says that to him. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a difference between boys and girls. The second thing I want you to know is kids lose assets over time. Sixth graders report higher levels of assets than do seventh graders. 
Seventh graders have higher levels of assets than do eighth graders. They drop every year through the senior year in high school. And the reason this becomes important for those of us who are grandparents, if you're working with, with little ones right now, they need to go into that elementary and middle school those years with a big cushion because they're going to lose assets over time. And, and people ask me, why does that happen? I think it's pretty obvious why it happens because it's a natural part of growth and development for children to push away from their parents and assert their independence. And when they push away from their parents and their grandparents, they are pushing away from their most constant and um, stable source of support. Does that make sense to you? And it leaves them more vulnerable. So all of us, as you think about this work, you wanna have really asset rich grandchildren early on because they're gonna lose them over time, all right? Now, having said that, again, we could go into a deeper dive, but, but I wanna move on to how do we do this because I think that's why most of you came today. I want you to know the model, but I want you to know, okay, if this makes sense, the question in all of our minds is how do you do this? How do you do it more consistently? more deliberately, more intentionally with your grandchildren. I'm going to do this. I know who's going to do this. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> I was doing a workshop several years ago, and a guy comes up to me at this point and says, people pay you to do this? He said, what are you, the CEO of Common Sense? And my, my comment was, it's common sense. It's not common practice. We know what to do. We don't do it consistently with our children or our grandchildren, right? So I want to talk about some ways of doing this consistently. But before I do that, you all know what this looks like. Many of you are here in this room today because somebody built these assets for you. And those of you at home, if you live on Bainbridge Island, you probably did pretty well as a kid growing up. And, and my sense is, and I know that's not true of everybody, so I'm not going to characterize everybody in that with that. But the fact that you're here today thinking about what you can do for your grandchildren tells me that you had some of these as a kid growing up, all right? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about who was there for you. Who built these assets for you as a kid growing up? And I'd like you to think about somebody other than your parent. You can think about a grandparent. You can think about a teacher, a coach. But I want you to think about somebody who is not the biological or or parent of this child, right? Um, for me, it was Mrs. McClellan, my seventh grade social studies teacher, who took me aside one day in seventh grade outside her classroom. And she said, I've seen your IQ test scores. You're really bright, and you're not working up to your potential. And she said, I'm going to expect more of you this year than I expect of other kids. She said, I'm going to work hard with you, but you and I are going to a higher level this year. I worked incredibly hard for her that year. And then it occurred to me about two years later, we never took IQ tests. <laughs> I have five, I have four brothers and sisters, there are five kids in our family. I asked all my siblings, you guys ever remember taking an IQ test? I don't think we ever took one. And to this day, I'm still wondering how many kids did she take outside her classroom <laughs> and tell them the same thing she told me. She got me. Right? I want you to think about who was there for you for just a moment. Who was there? Who built these assets? And what did they do that was so powerful that you remember them? I mean, I'm 73 years old and I remember my seventh grade teacher and I was 12 or 13 years old at the time. Why would I remember somebody 60 years later? She must have done something pretty powerfully, right? So for just a moment, I want you to reflect on who did this for you, all right? And again, really quickly, with the person next to you, beside you, behind you, I want you to take two minutes to share who that person was and what they, they, they do. And if you can't think of anybody, it's okay. But I want you to then talk about what you would have liked to have had. If somebody would have bothered to have done this for me and when I was a kid, it would have been huge, all right? because some of us didn't have that, what would have been helpful? For those of you in the virtual audience, again, I want you to make a list really quickly of those folks who were the asset builders in your life um, 
And what did they do? Really quickly reflect on what did they do? Just put a little note beside their name that reminds you of what they did that made them so powerful that you still remember them. You got two minutes to do this, go. With a partner, do it, go. Now, I know, <clears throat> I know you could spend more time on this, but I wanna make sure our virtual audience doesn't have that, that opportunity. Uh, well, if you're there with a partner, you can do this. I also want to know, you know online that we are looking at your comments and a couple things came up from those online comments that I would like to address. Somebody um, shared that they had very few of these as a kid growing up. Um, and I know for some people, this may have been a very difficult exercise. It's a reminder of what wasn't there for some of you. Um, but I want to point out if you're here today and you're thinking about what you can do for your grandchildren, um, I just want to point out, remember at the beginning, I said we would learn the most from the kids who came from adversity and made it in spite of that adversity. What the research tells me, if you had very few of those and you are here today, you are one of those people. You probably should be the proudest to be here because what my research says is you bootstrapped it. But you have a gift to share, especially for kids who come from adversity. <clears throat> because what I know about the kids who come from adversity, they believe they're alone. They don't believe anybody else is dealing with the crap they're dealing with in their life. They need to know some adult has been through this and come out the other end reasonably healthy, reasonably competent, and a contributing member of their community. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you're one of those people who looked at this list and went, whoa, this is hard because I didn't have them. I appreciate that, but I also want you to know you are in a unique position to help the kids who are now struggling with adversity and trauma in their lives, all right? Don't, don't discount that, it's really important. Now, jumping ahead, I wanna give you four quick strategies before our time is up. <laughs> I'm doing a lousy job of managing time today, but I'm gonna do my best to give you four, okay? Huh? We need another session. Well, maybe we'll do another session at some point. But the first thing I want you to think about is when we try and connect with our grandkids, um, my first question would be, do you know their love language? Do you know what I'm talking about? There are two authors, their names are Campbell and Chapman. Most of their work was done with um, couples on marriage retreats. And they found that couples had problems in their relationships if they didn't speak the same love language. If you're a toucher and your partner is not, you're thinking, if he really loved me, he'd just be a little more affectionate. He's thinking, I remember every anniversary. I publicly affirm what a wonderful person you are. You know, I, I do all these nice things. But you're thinking, if he really loved me, he'd just be more affectionate. Does this make sense? You don't have to raise your hand. This is not marriage counseling today, okay? But our grandchildren have love languages too. And let me go through these really quickly. The first is some of our grandkids are nonverbal. Dylan, my second oldest grandson, is a hugger. <laughs> I told him early on, that human beings need 16 hugs a day in order to stay healthy. <laughs> Every time he sees me, he walks in the door and he does 16 hugs and he counts them. One, two, three. <laughs> because he knows Poppy needs 16 hugs and he does too. It's the smile, it's the nod, it's the thumbs up, it's the pat on the back. Some of our children read that you love me when you touch me, okay? Now, others love words of affirmation, okay? Are we being invaded? <laughs> um, this is the kid who can be across the room and if you say something to somebody else in the room about this kid, they immediately, they heard you and they love words of affirmation. How many of you have one, a grandchild that is one of those kids who loves words of affirmation? You can watch them, they just light up when you start talking about what's right with them, right? Okay, um, 
We, uh, we did a project in the uh, Garden Grove School District. I'm going to show you this. Um, and we were trying to help teachers be a little more deliberate and intentional in the work. And so we developed post-it notes. They are pre-printed. They say things on them like, I, I got to remember, I got to read it for, oh. It says, and I'll give them to you after this. Uh, and those of you at home might, might want to write these sentence stems down. The first one says, I noticed something really special about you today. It is, okay? The second one, a special thank you for. Third one says, you have no idea how much you help me when. All you got to do is finish the sentence, all right? I'm delighted when you. Finish the sentence. And the last one says, you can feel very proud of yourself for, finish the sentence. We gave these to staff and they would put them on kids' work when they turned them back to them, you know, their assignments. They'd put them on their desk in the morning when they walked in and they'd see that note on their desk. <laughs> what the teachers found, when they give ki the kids who loved words of affirmation, when you give them back their assignment, they looked at their grade, then they looked at this note, they pulled the note off through the paper in the, their assignment in the wastebasket and put the note in their backpack, okay? I want you uh, right now, and for those of you at home, we're gonna give you these again. Um, for those of you in the audience, really quickly, take two or three, maybe we can have some help, Shannon, with these. Take two or three of these, and I want you to write a note right now to one of your grandchildren. Or, if, again, if they're too young, write it to their parents. Or write it to your, your spouse or your sweetie, and you can give it to them tonight at home. I want you to deliver a word of affirmation today, especially to grandkids, if you can do that. And by the way, those of you at home, if you can text them, they are just as powerful. If you can surprise them with them, they are powerful. Put it on their pillow put it on their plate when they come to the dinner table. Surprise makes them more powerful. So I want you to take one of those. And again, for those of you at home, while you're writing them, I want to go over these with you again. Yes, and April put them in the- um, Oh, great. In the chat. Just a couple though. So okay. 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 Yeah, April will put them online for you. And I want you, if you're online, I want you to complete a word, a sentence uh, for each of your grandchildren. And again, if they're too young, complete a sentence for their parents. <laughs> okay, as you're finishing these up, let me just go quickly through the other love languages. So words of affirmation are really important. The next one, how many of you have one that really wants your time? Yeah, they do, but it's, for some time is more important than others. Um, this is the kid, you're incredibly busy, you're trying to get something done and they are right there under your feet and they're not about to get out of your way because they want your time and they know if you love them, you give them time. You know, and we budget time for a lot of other things. We need to make sure we budget time for each of them. And, and um, our oldest Alex is a time guy. He likes to FaceTime, he likes to text with me. Um, he's a time guy, we, he's learning to drive so we're out. Be careful on Bainbridge Island on weekends when he's up here, because we're out in my old Ford Explorer because he can't do a lot of damage. <laughs> and, but he wants that time, and it's not because we're driving, it's because we're talking, okay? Some of our kids really recognize when you go beyond their expectations. It's a little gift, it's a card, it's their favorite treat, it's their favorite dinner that you make for them. They know when you've gone out of your way to do something really just for them, that's a huge statement. And uh, I have to tell you, it's the gift thing. Our, our daughters um, had different love languages. Emily, the youngest, I'd come home from being on the road, and I used to do this a lot on the road. I'd open up the door and she'd just come flying into my arms and run up and jump into my arms and she'd hug and snuggle and cuddle and she just wanted to hug and cuddle and snuggle and read. 
Amy, our, our older daughter, likes gifts. So I, I would bring her home, I know this sounds weird, I'd bring her home soap and shampoo from hotel rooms, right? And she, and she would come to the door and say, Daddy, did you bring me soap? Yes, I did. And you know what? I didn't get it. Here's what I learned. We tend to speak our love language, the thing that means the most to us, and that's not necessarily what our grandchildren appreciate. Does that make sense to you? So if you're a hugger and a cuddler and a snuggler, you know, you're doing that with all your grandkids and some of them think that's great and others, there's something missing for them. So our job is to figure out what their love language is and try and speak it as consistently as we can in their lives, okay? So the first thing I want you to think about is I want you to think about love languages and try and figure out what are the primary love language of, what is the primary love language of each of your grandchildren, all right? Second strategy, you need to do a lot of thinking out loud for grandchildren. They don't know what goes on in an adult mind. They watch you in real stressful situations that would be stressful for them and you just handle it. And they think you're born with that, okay? How do we teach children the social competencies they need in order to be successful? I believe it's by thinking out loud. So if something happens, Larry is, is in the car in front of me on the freeway and he cuts me off and, and I'm upset about that, but I don't do anything. The grandchildren don't learn anything from that experience. But if I say, boy, that makes me angry when people do that, it, it puts me in danger and it puts them in danger. You know, I, I feel like just taking them and sit, shaking them. And then I wanna say, but I'm not gonna do that. I need to stop. That wouldn't be productive. It, wouldn't, it would put everybody else at greater risk. I need to get myself under control right now. Do you know what I'm doing right now? What am I modeling for my grandchild? Anger management and self-control. How many of you have one that has a hard time with anger management? Yeah. And if you want to teach them, by the way, it doesn't tell them to settle down, <laughs> doesn't help that situation. It's modeling for them what that sounds like. I'm gonna count for ten to 10. I'm gonna take three deep breaths. I'm gonna get myself under control right now because I'm feeling really uneasy. Does that make sense to you? So. The, the second strategy I want you to do a lot with your grandchildren is I want you to do a lot of thinking out loud. In stressful situations, when you're making tough decisions, I don't know what to do right now. I'm gonna think this through. I'm gonna think, I'm gonna make a list of the pros and cons right now before I make a decision. Do you understand what I'm doing when I say that to my grandchildren? I'm modeling for them good decision making, all right? Think out loud. It's a really powerful thing. They don't know what goes on in a fully adult brain. And what we do know is their frontal lobe, which controls reason and judgment, is not well developed. And it won't be until they're, by the way, this is why 18-year-olds should not have access to weapons. Their frontal lobe, especially boys, is not well developed. And it won't be until 25 or 27 years of age for most boys. Okay? but we can help them develop that and we should. Enough said. The next strategy, I'm gonna try and get these. You want me to pull this up again? Yeah, we can pull it up on the screen I'm if you would be, thank you. I'm sorry, I doing this for you, but um, you, if you can just talk a little bit, we'll get there. All right, um, so the next strategy is, I wanna teach you one social skill. We were just talking about social skills. I wanna teach you one social skill that all of your grandchildren need. It's how to say no to their friends, all right? And um, in order to do that, uh, Jody Kelly, can I have you come up here for just a moment? This is, this is the danger. If you came to the real session, I know why some of you are home. I can see the Stovers in there. I can see you guys. Just so you know, I, I see you. Tom um, is trouble and you call me. You come up here. So if... If Jody is a five-year-old, my five-year-old granddaughter, and I'm trying to teach her to open a door with a key, 
teaching children a physical skill is a lot like teaching them a social skill, all right? So if I were teaching my granddaughter to open a door with a key, what are some things that I should do? Demonstrate. Demonstrate, yeah. So modeling, if they can see it, they're more likely to do it. The first thing though I'm gonna try and do is I want her to be motivated to do this. And it might sound like this. Jody, a big girl knows how to open a door with a key and I know you're a big girl and I know you can do this. What am I doing right now? I'm just trying to get her motivated to learn the skill. And this is a hard one, but I think you can do it, okay? So here's, here's what we're gonna do. The first thing we're gonna do is you gotta get the right key and it's the big one on my keychain is the door, it's the front door, okay? And you have to make sure that the teeth point up like the mountains, all right? So they point up and so you take it, okay? And we're gonna do this together. We're gonna to insert that key in the lock, okay? And then you're gonna turn it and you're gonna turn, you turn it, turn it towards the window. Now push the door and the door opens. Boom, you did a great job. Now I'm gonna see if you can do it all by yourself. You have to pick the right key. You pick the right key. Okay, what did you learn? Put it in with the mountains up. Turn next to the windows. And push. Boom. A little round of applause for yeah. Jody. She did really well. So teaching kids social skills, there are some steps in this. And I try to demonstrate a few of them for you here. The first is you got to motivate them, okay? The second is you break it down into small teachable steps. You don't just give them the key and say, here, do it. You know, you have to get the right key, you have to turn. But I tried, the next step is I tried to explain, I modeled for her with her, and I tried to explain in terms that were age appropriate for a five-year-old, okay? By the way, adults do too much talking and not enough time modeling. When in doubt, model, all right? The next one is give them a chance to practice. And what I did with Jody to start out with, I call guided practice. I took her hand the first time and we did it. And then I let her do it on her own. You want to ensure success, and especially in social skills. If I'm trying to teach a kid how to say no to their friends, if they get embarrassed trying to do this in a real life setting, they will never do it with their friends. They don't want to be embarrassed. So I need to make sure they are successful from the beginning, all right? The next step in the skill is give them some feedback. You did a great job. I'm really proud of you, okay? And the next one is sometimes they need to understand, by the way, this is the same skill for opening the front door and the back door and the key to the shed. So they understand this is a skill you can use in a variety of settings, all right? And the last is you might let them in some cases customize. They might say, I wouldn't do it that way, grandma. And what do you say? Show me how you would do it. There is more than one way to do some of this, right? <laughs> a friend of mine, so this kid came to the table and they had their, they've been talking, four-year-old, been talking about getting your shoes on and getting them on and came to the, the, the uh, table with, with their shoes on and, and the friend looks and says, those are on the wrong feet. And, and her grandchild said, they're on my feet. <laughs> Were, she was per perfectly comfortable with the right and left shoe being on the wrong foot, but so anyway. So, so now I'm going I'm to take one skill really quickly. How do you say no to your friend? All right. Um, in this case, Sid, can I get you to come up here for just a second? <laughs> <laughs> By the way. I, I really appreciate my friends and neighbors being here in the audience. I know you'll never come again, but, but it helps us today. So if, if you think about teaching kids how to say no to their friends, and I'm gonna model it first, and then we're gonna bring it up on the screen. So here's my, we're gonna talk about doing this with older grandkids. Here's my girlfriend, Sid. We're juniors in high school. Sid comes up to me, it's Friday afternoon, and she comes up to me and says, hey Clay, a group of our friends are going to Secret Beach. They got a keg of beer, it's gonna be a big party. You wanna go, okay? This is my girlfriend. What do, here's what I hear parents saying to their, their kids about this or their grandkids, just say no. 
Do you ever think about what that really looks like? Here's my girlfriend that I care a lot about. And she says, hey, you want to go to Secret Beach? And I say, no, Sid. Just say no and walk away. You know any 16-year-old who do that with his girlfriend? No. Yeah, because she wouldn't be my girlfriend. And, you know, this... If, it's a, if I got a risk of relationship or risk trouble, which will I do? I'll risk trouble before I'll risk the relationship. That one doesn't work. Say no and walk away. You know what else I hear parents and grandparents saying to their kids? Just make an excuse and get out of it. Oh, Sid, I'd really like to go, but my dog's been really sick, and I think it's serious like dental problems. I got to go, <laughs> I gotta go home and check on my dog maybe some other time. What am I doing right now? Lying. What do we tell our children about lying? Don't lie. When you say to your children, make an excuse and get out of it, what are you really saying? Lie to your friends. If I lie to you on a regular basis, will you continue to be my girlfriend? No. no. So let me just show you a third way. Sid comes up and says, hey, Clay, Secret Beach, keg of beer, all of our friends are gone. Okay. And I say, I say, so what's going on? She said, they got a keg of beer. It's going to be a great party. The next thing I say, Sid, that's really trouble for me. First of all, if the coach finds out, I get booted off the team, and I've worked too hard to be a starter this year. And I just got my license, which means we got wheels. If I get busted, I lose my license, and we can't do anything. So look, instead, there's a dance in Paul's bow. Some of our friends are going. You like to dance. I like to dance. You want to go? Yes. Then why are you sitting there? Come okay. On. <laughs> I know it's not that easy, but that's a skill. And let me just point out, it has steps. Let me show you really quickly what those steps look like. The first step is, is teach your grandchildren to ask questions. You know, here's my friend Nancy. We're middle school kids. I know she has a history of taking things without paying for them. If Nancy comes up to me and says, hey, Clay, you want to go down to the Jiffy? What should I do? What's step one? Ask questions. Ask questions. What would be a good question? <laughs> a good question would be, Nancy, you got any money? <laughs> Nancy says, no, but slow Bob is working the counter, and he likes girls. And I'll keep him busy. You go grab a two-pound bag of M&Ms. We'll split them outside. Do I have to ask any more questions? Plain or peanut? <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's shoplifting, right? So the first thing is to ask questions. And we try and teach kids a phrase. What are we going to do? Next step is name the trouble. If you notice, I said to Sid, that's trouble for me. Because if the coach finds out, I get booted off the team. By the way, parents and grandparents, I see a lot of parents who are unwilling or unable to set limits for their children. They need to know, here are the rules and here are the limits. It really helps them with step two, which is to say, look, if I did that, and it, what I would say to Nancy in this case, she said, let's go down to the Jiffy. You know, and I'd say, you got any money? She said, no, but slow Bob's working the counter. I said, look, that's trouble for me. If we got caught doing that, I wouldn't be able to hang out with you anymore, and you're my best friend. You know my dad. He wouldn't let us hang out together, OK? Name the trouble, OK? The, second, the third step is identify the consequences. Again, if I did that, we wouldn't be able to hang out together. And the next one is suggest an alternative. Here's what I want you to remember. If you're teaching this to your grandchildren, make sure you teach them. And if you notice what I did with Sid, I said, Hey, let's go. There's a dance going on in Paul's Bowl. Let's go. And I physically got up and moved. Peer pressure shifts when kids suggest an alternative and start to move. Who has to make a decision now? Sid, I just made my decision. Now the pressure shifts to Sid. When I was feeling pressured just a few minutes ago, I'm now in control. I'm saying, no, let's go to Paul's Bowl. If Sid had said no, this is what it would have sounded like. Look, if you change your mind, I'm going to be around till about five. I'd really like to go with you. But if you don't go, I'm going to go do something with the guys. But I'd rather be with you. I need to physically get up and move at that point. There is something psychological about being left. Kids don't like to be left behind, even if she wants to go to the party. If she cares about me, 
this doesn't feel good to her. Does that make sense to you? You need to teach your kids and grandkids to physically get up and move when they suggest that alternative. Now, we, what I'd, I'd like to, you to think about here is the way to teach this, and you can teach this to children at a very young age. So if you've got little guys and you're thinking, well, this is about teaching middle schoolers and high schoolers, don't think that. You can teach this to preschoolers. Here's how you do it. At our house, we have hand puppets, and one of them is a constant troublemaker. And the kids all know, this is like Sesame Street, you can have one bad puppet, right? Who's always, not bad puppet, just always suggesting things, and you can role play with the puppet. By the way, trying to role play with your grandma as a troublemaker, they never would believe that grandma would ask them to do things that are bad, but they can believe the puppet would. Does that make sense? Role playing is the best way to teach children this skill, okay? And I can coach them and cue them all the way along. As an example, if they forget to do step one, I can just say, what are we gonna do? I use the words I want them to say, okay? Ask questions, what are we gonna do? That's, have them fill, that's shoplifting. By the way, I try and teach younger children the legal names of troubles because legal names imply legal consequences, all right? You know, it's, let's go beat up Billy, that sounds one way. If I, if I ask my friend, let's go commit assault and battery, does that sound different? You need to teach them the legal names of trouble and not all t troubles are illegal. So you also need to talk about inner trouble with your grandchildren. Inner trouble sounds like this. I wouldn't feel good about doing that. We are in deep trouble as a society if the only reason they don't do it is because it's illegal. Does that make sense to you? At some level, we need to teach our grandchildren to talk about inner trouble. Inner trouble sounds like this. I wouldn't feel good about doing that. What's their friend gonna say? Oh, yes, you would? <laughs> no, trust me, I wouldn't, okay? Now, for time's sake, again, you have a handout, those of you uh, who are doing this virtually. Um, I hope you've downloaded that uh, on the backside of your handout here in the audience. You have the list of the social skills and you also have how to deal with pressure. In a real life situation for our grandchildren, it's not as simple as what I just showed you with Sid. Because Sid is likely to say, come on, Clay, we're not gonna get caught. Don't be a wuss, you never do anything anymore. <laughs> so pressure sounds like that, and you need to teach your grandchildren in any other situation, you teach them to be polite and not interrupt. But in this situation, I want you to teach them to interrupt. When somebody's asking you to do something that's real trouble, you need to use their name. Reed, listen to me. If Reed doesn't stop, come on, we're not gonna get caught. If the second thing is, Reed, are you gonna listen to me? Ask it as a question. He still keeps coming. Come on, we're not gonna get caught. You're such a chicken. And the last one, it sounds like this. Reed, if you don't listen, I'm gonna leave because I need to be able to talk here. He'll stop. The kids go, oh good, he stopped. And they go, oh God, what do I do next? <laughs> If you forget everything else, jump right to the suggest an alternative step, all right? Now, here's what I'm gonna suggest you do as homework. <clears throat> because we don't have time to do it here, I want you to go home tonight while it's still fresh in your mind, and I want you to try and either over the phone with a friend, um, with your partner, um, or with an older, by the way, I like to teach my older grandkids a skill, and I tell them we're doing this so I can teach Avon and Remy the skill. And they look up to you. So if you know how to do it, you can help me teach them the skill. And who's learning the most in that process? The older ones, okay? So I want you to practice it before you try and teach it to your grandkids, because if you don't look good doing it, they don't want to learn it. They can look bad without you, okay? Now, one more strategy, and then we're going to open up for a few questions here at the end. Um, the last one is I want to talk about how we teach grandkids positive values. And we can go away from the screen if you like. Okay. <clears throat> a guy shows up in my office several years ago. Um, his name is John Graham. He's a Harvard graduate and former CIA operative in Vietnam. Really interesting guy. And he says, I need your help. I said, 
what, what, do you, what do you need? He said, he knew what I did for a living, this kind of work. He said, I want you to help me teach children to be courageous. As soon as he said that, he could have set the hook, he had me. I said, that's a great concept. He said, yeah, he and his partner, Ann Medlock, have been identifying people around the United States and around the world who stick their necks out and do courageous things in their community. They call those people giraffes because they have long necks and they stick them out regularly. If you like this concept, if you go to the Giraffe Project online, you can access their stories about heroes, all right? And these are everyday heroes. So I said, so how do you teach children to be courageous? He said, it's not that difficult. It's a three-step process. I said, so, so what are the steps? He said, the first thing is you need to tell them stories. As grandparents, we tell our children, our grandchildren, lots of stories. I want you to continue to tell them stories, especially stories that have a moral, okay? Let me just give you an example. And if you can tell them stories that are in their own family, they are more powerful. Um, my mom passed away a few years ago, but before she passed away, she lived in an assisted care facility and just right across the water so I could just take the boat, walk over and, and see her. And um, she was in her mid eighties and she was in a, a jazzy power chair cause she couldn't get around. Um, she was mentally sharp, but physically really struggling. She had two buddies that she, every day they had all their meals together. These are three women all in power chairs. And um, I came over one day to take her to lunch and uh, she was already down there with her buddies and their, her buddy said, oh, you should have seen your mom last week. My mom was this feisty principled lady. Um, and, and in this assisted care facility, there was a guy who also was in a wheelchair, not a power chair, but he would shuffle down to meals in his wheelchair and he was gnarly and surly and, and no one wanted to sit with him. And he would make comments about the staff and most of the staff in this facility were women most of them women of color. Many of them, English was not their first language. My mother loved these women. And this guy one day made a racist comment about one of the women that was serving him. And my mom overheard. And she says to this guy, he's in his mid eighties, she's in her mid eighties. She said, why don't you shut up? And he turns to her and he flips her off, mid eighties, and he shuffles back to his chair. And my mom, being who she was, picks up a pitcher of water in her power chair, and she's not good with it, so she does like a 360. And then she goes over, and he's shuffling out, and she's powering out. And she dumps this water in his crotch to the cheers of residents and staff. I said, oh my God, this is my mom. And I, as I'm taking her out to lunch, we go by the front desk and the woman at the front desk says, Mrs. Roberts, when you come back, remember you have to sign our new code of conduct policy. <laughs> I said, mom, do you think this has anything to do with what you did? And she said, I don't care, he deserved it and I'd do it again. Okay. Equality and social justice were important to my mother. Every grandkid has heard that story. If you want to teach your kids values, you got to tell them the stories. So find the stories in your family, tell them those stories regularly, and then help them find. So the first step in teaching them positive values is tell them stories. The second is help them find stories and let them tell you stories. If we're talking about courage, ask your grandchildren, have you ever seen anybody do a courageous act at school, at your preschool? And let them tell you the story. And the last step in teaching them positive values is help them become the story. You need to create opportunities for children to exercise those values. If you're trying to teach them to give back to their community, you can certainly share how you're trying to do it. That's a story. You can have them share with you how they've seen others do it, but then you need to create opportunities for them to give back to their communities. Does that make sense? So it's tell the story, find the story, 
become the story. That's how we teach positive values to our grandchildren, all right? Now, I'm gonna see where we are time-wise. Um, I wanna, first of all, I wanna just stop here because I wanna make sure people have a chance to ask a few questions, both in our in-person audience and in our virtual audience, because I've been trying to cover a lot of ground in a short period of time, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm doing justice to any of this, but, but I wanna make sure you go away with at least a couple things that in your mind you could do. And by the way, I know many of you are already doing a lot of what we've talked about here today. It's simply about becoming more deliberate and intentional in that work. It's about doing it more often. And um, as, as you leave today, I have a wristband that says, take a second, make a difference. Because if you're like I am, you go to sessions like this and you think, I'm gonna do this, but you get caught up in whatever you're doing tomorrow and, it, and you forget. So I need a constant reminder. So I, I have wristbands for each of you that are here and it simply says, take a second, make a difference. That reminds me. So if you're willing to wear one, pick one up on the way out, but let's open it to questions, comments, thoughts, and you may have some ideas that you wanna share that you do with your grandkids that work really well for you and you think help to build these assets. And by the way, when people ask you from this point forward, what are you doing these days? And I hear a lot of folks saying, well, I'm retired. I'm keeping busy. I actually, one of the reasons I did this session today is I, I've been known lately as Mr. Pickleball. <laughs> and, I, and I love pickleball and I love, the, and it's not because we've created pickleball courts and I like to play, it's because we've created a community that cares about each other, that takes care of each other, okay? I don't want my grandkids to think when I pass away, when they are asked, what did your grandpa do? Oh, he was really a good pickleball player. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Um, I, I think this is- They might be proud of that. They, they might be, but I'm, I'm more proud of the other work we've done over the years and I want them to know about it, okay? So when people ask you what you do, I would love it if you would say, I'm retired, but I spend a lot of time building assets with my grandkids. And when they say, what's that? I want you to share this list with them. We're trying to create a movement here in our community and in Kitsap County and in, in, in the greater world about becoming asset builders. And the way this happens is by sharing it over the back fence with your neighbors, with your partners and spouses, with your children, Share the message. Uh, that's how movements start. Okay. So, questions. I have one. Your grandson comes to you and says, "What can I do for you?" I can't hear you. When, when your grandchild comes to you and says, "What well, everybody else is doing," where do you go with that? Um, uh, when the question is, when your when your grandkids come to you and say, "Everybody else is doing it," what's the response? Um, my response is generally, I've done a lot of surveying over the years. And the people who are doing it like to say everybody's doing it. But let me just give you an example. In terms of drug use, less than 20% of the kids are involved in, in drug use and less than 5% are involved in heavy drug use. Everybody's not doing it. But the people who think and want you to do it, they want you to believe everybody's doing it. It's generally not true, okay? So I just try and give them some data and and and, and even if everybody else is doing it, I also want to ask them, would you feel good about doing that? You don't have to answer that for me, but I want you to think about, would that create inner trouble for you? And I think a lot of us know when we're doing things that are not appropriate, it creates, it creates some real inner troubles and, and it doesn't feel good, okay? What else? Any online questions, April? Uh, no, but we had someone who did the UK. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm Kathy. There's a question here. Yeah. I a, hi, I have a question. Um, I have to leave shortly for another meeting, but I have a six-year-old grandson. Parents are not together anymore. Dad lets him play video games constantly all day and all night. Mom's not the same way, but he's at this point right now where he's into this Minecraft and... Uh 
so I would just like your feelings about that and how they've limited, they've just put a time limit. They're working on time limits with him now. And do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I certainly believe that the question is, for those of you who didn't hear it, um, a grandson who's six, did I hear that correctly? And, and is spending a lot of time in front of a screen playing Minecraft and other things. You know, I, I do think kids, obviously I have grandkids that spend a lot of time online, but I think limits are really important. And, and even if there are not limits at, at home, there are limits when they come to grandma and poppy's house, okay? Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, what I want to say about technology, I, I think technology is great. In a high-tech world, though, I believe that touch, high touch, is even more important. Real relationships, not virtual relationships, are become even more important in a high-tech world. So, um, and I think explaining that to parents and to your children that we're going to spend time together doing things that are fun. And I think coming up with activities that they love to do so that it, it doesn't feel like a penalty. I have to give up my online time to spend time talking to you. Let me just give you a quick example. I play a game with my grandkids. It's called bowling for grandkids. It's a big exercise ball. We go out on the lawn and I bowl after them. If I hit them, it freezes them and the other grandkids have to tag them to unfreeze them. I can't tell you how many times, and I'm talking about even my 16, year old grandson, he likes it now because they can't catch him. He said, can we play bowling for grandkids? I've got, you know, a six year old and a 16 year old and kids in between playing it. So you need to find things that they love to do. And even, um, even if you're online with them in front of a screen this year, we found games during the pandemic that we could play with them. We play a game called Facts and Five that we, grandma and I play with the older boys online. <laughs> and there's a game that we play with the little ones. It's a card game called, as, as my little guy calls it, Twick Your Friend. <laughs> Trick Your Friend, it's the game is really called Screw Your Buddy, so I couldn't tell him that. <laughs> and, and they love it and he loves it because he gets to sit, to put these Twick cards, screw cards on me and he doesn't care if he wins or not, he just loves to lay those out. So I try and find things that don't seem like a penalty they wanna do, just telling them to put it down without a good alternative of something else to do that they like to do and that is fun for them. I think that's part of the key of getting, of limiting screen time. Anyway, others, other people have an idea about that? Thank you. Yeah, my, uh, my wife always has a uh, art project set out, even if it's corny, mm -hmm. and she just starts doing it, and the grandson will, okay, humor you. You know, he puts down the phone so he can dye eggs or yeah. do a coloring thing or a folding thing, which, but she had to kind of set it up first. Sure, and, and being prepared for that and having ahead of time, I think, makes a huge difference. It makes you can jump right into it and not have to kind of transition difficultly into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Other questions, thoughts? So let me, let me just wrap this up by saying, um, first of all, thank you and the virtual audience for being with us today. And, and um, thank you. Thank you for putting up with my lack of, of uh, skill in dealing with our video audience. So I'm, I'm I'm, I'm trying and hopefully it came across. You got some of it. Thank you guys for coming in person. Um, I, and um, I, I just wanna thank you all for what you already do that builds assets for your kids because I think, and grandkids, I think you're already doing this. I would just ask that you think about how can I be more deliberate and intentional in the work. I wanna thank, um, first of all, I wanna thank the Senior Center and Reed for, I would have been, totally toast without you up here today and for um, all the things, the great things you do. By the way, this is the training ground for pickleball. We, all, these, all these table tennis players that, that play here now show up at our courts and they're just dynamite. So um, we may do something next week to, to out to the senior center folks about pickleball. But, all right, and you can play ten, table tennis here, training ground three times a week. Yeah, so thanks to Reed. Thanks to April and Shannon for their support, both through 
what used to be called Raising Resilience and now is part of um, Bainbridge Youth Services without their work, which has been really, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about pioneering. We're so far ahead in this community because of the vision they have and the direction they're going. Make sure that you support them and, and one call and for whatever and in other ways you can. So a little round of applause for our. Thank you, John. Yeah, we are. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks.